Yeah, welcome everybody at the AGM. Uh, first time for me that I'm here as an actual exhibitor and um, telling you a little bit about uh, like who I or who we are. I'm here together with Jenna, uh, my teammate. We're uh, both doing acrobatic wingsuit flying. I've uh, been in the sport since about 1999. Uh, Jenna a little bit shorter. And both been doing a lot of wingsuit flying and been involved with the wingsuit tunnel basically from the start. And especially through that, really sort of pushed uh, the wingsuit acrobatic flying, uh, basically just all the, the active rolling and flipping wingsuit around the sky stuff. Oh, there's more people coming in. <clears throat> so, um, first a quick thing, just so I know a little bit, like who here is like skydiver or wingsuiter? Yeah, that's practically almost everyone. No, just so I know a little bit like in what terms to talk. So uh, what I'm going to talk about today is for a large portion just basically how the whole wingsuit discipline developed from the start and then spurred in between a uh, little, uh, little nuggets about safety, gear choice and those kind of things. Um, I, I do have severe ASD, so every once in a while I do have a tendency to struggle a little bit off path. So uh, I do have my, uh, my teammate there who has like a, a secret signal <laughs> in case something is going too far off path. So because of that reason, I would say like, let's first go through the whole presentation. If there's questions, if you could hang on to them till the end, because that sort of prevents us from going on 75 bunny trails. Um, so uh, what I'm going to start with is basically where most of the media quotes that wingsuit flying started. I think in my view is more somebody that was a bit delusional and should have been stopped. But uh, there was, in 1912, there was Franz Reichel, um, and he thought he could fly. So he basically constructed, I wouldn't say it's a wingsuit, but he constructed this apparatus. Um, so anyways, he jumped off the Eiffel Tower. I think anyone can guess what the end result of that one was, but basically a very deep crater at the bottom of the Eiffel Tower. I think they put tiles there now. But um, yeah, that was... The thing that's by most quoted as like what the start of wingsuiting is. Um, the real true start to like wingsuit flying was around the 1930s, uh, where there was uh, basically Henry Ward, uh, who I think was American if I remember correct, uh, Clemson, who was from the UK, and Leo Valentin, who was French. And at that point in time, skydiving was basically at a point where it was mostly used to kick troops out of an airplane over enemy territory. And the method of free fall at that point was basically grab onto your handle and then slide off the wing of an airplane, pray and pull. Um, it was Leo Valentin, I think, is often credited with being the first one to invent actually stable free fall. So he started going for like, sort of like, I think what we now call a delta position. Um, but it, all three of them at some point sort of got bored of normal free fall and started experimenting with wings and there's like a big variation if you just basically type early wingsuiting into Google you get a load of pictures with these kind of apparatuses British Pate which is uh, not a food but a website doing all the archival footage stuff if you type Birdman or wingsuit in there you actually get a lot of nice footage and by estimates uh, this guy which I think is Clemson there's some footage of him flying in these wings, and he's actually doing a pretty reasonable glide ratio. Now, I don't know if everybody knows like the term glide ratio, but it basically is often quoted in a number that means how far you go forward for every meter you go down. So it's like a glide ratio of one and a half is like one and a half meter forward for every meter you fall. The glide ratio you see him doing in the videos actually looks like pretty good, like around something pretty much higher than what the first wingsuits first modern wingsuits were doing, like a glide ratio of around two. Um, that is, of course, a guesstimate because like GPS and all this stuff wasn't around at that time. But these guys were doing pretty impressive flying. Uh, the downside is the materials they were using were all quite heavy. And also the skydiving gear they were using in general was, you know, not the, to today's standards and safety. So there isn't an exact number of even the number of people that were flying with these kind of contraptions and I think it's probably about a dozen or so but media often likes to quote that over 60 like people have died in the initial pioneering since we've started going online more I've been contacted by I think two or three really old guys that sent photos in that they were also jumping all wings so by all means it hasn't been like the the mass suicide streak that the media has always made it but there's been quite a few guys doing this kind of stuff. Several of the guys that have died, um, 
I think if I remember correctly, and this is something that you'd have to actually look up to get the real facts, but since Trump is president, anything goes, as long as you say it loud enough. So, um, but I, if I recall correctly, I'm son actually died during a landing incident where basically the, the dowels you see like that are holding his wing tights, I think it was like whale baleen uh, or like bones or something like that he was using, and essentially one went in here and came out here. Um, the, um, uh, Henry Ward was actually jumping something much more like what the actual like Dubai guys are jumping like it almost looked the same like a massive wooden wing and all he had was he jumped out of a side door plane and basically one wing caught air slammed it to the airplane broke and he just went down like this and then the parachute wrapped around so it's it's definitely I think a lot of problems were related to yeah basically both the older gear and not the knowledge that we have these days um, the first real modern wingsuit flying came when uh, Patrick de Gardon basically, um, he's one of those French people that was talented in everything, you know, like champion in just about any discipline. And he started to, um, uh, to basically experiment with like actual wing designs. And he was the very first person to actually go for an inflatable airfoil. So following the, the design of a modern parachute, it had an inlet on the suits and it inflated. Um, this was actually something where he made massive progression, like he was much more free in the flying that he was doing. And he essentially had something like a piano wire running through the arm wing that also allowed him to sort of cut away and release the arm wing. Uh, Patrick did a lot of really impressive stuff. He did, I think what could be credited as like the first actual proximity flights. So flying the wingsuits like past terrain he did flybys past tourists in uh, uh, Acquis de Midi, which is like uh, in Chamonix, like one of the higher points that's now used a lot for base jumping. He did jumps into the Grand Canyon, and he did quite a lot of stuff. Most of the time, uncredited, his camera guy was actually a British jumper, Adrian Nicholas, who also was part of like that initial first pioneering. Um, sadly, um, there, uh, or I'm skipping actually something, uh, he was also the very first one to actually exit an airplane fly with a porter and fly back in. Sadly there, it was a stunt sponsored by Sector, a watch company, and when he died, Sector was like, ooh, not good. So they sort of hit a lot of the footage and involvement of what Patrick has done. So there is like a few very pixelated clips on YouTube where you can find that, but a lot of the stuff he did is sadly because it was essentially sponsored by a company that after he died, wasn't too happy with the association, tried to hide a lot of that stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, sadly, Adrian died at some point because um, what he tried to do was, if you're looking behind the rig, there's this sort of big empty thing. And what he tried to do was try to see if he could make this sort of like a smoother surface so that the airflow would not get that big turbulence behind the, behind the rig. So he essentially made a big foam piece, sewed it on behind his rig, but the big thing he did is he rushed it and he did it in between two jumps and in sewing it onto the container, he didn't take the canopy out and he just sewed two lines of his mane onto the container. So when he opened his parachutes, ended up with a horseshoe malfunction, then fired the reserve into that. And yeah, that was sadly the end of um, what uh, Patrick was doing. Um, but what did happen was with the flying, he actually inspired quite a few people. And there's basically, I think, three people that are like the, the main ones to credit. And uh, the first one actually is Januel Itstein, and he was, I think, the first of like the other groups that sort of inspired by Patrick started flying similar designs, and they actually made the designs partly assisted by uh, Patrick even. So um, uh, this is the Porter entry. This is like the most pixelated image I could find of that. Um, this is one of the sort of like first like designs of somebody that essentially copied with Patrick's permission the wingsuits that he was doing. Uh, these days, John Wall actually runs the company Adrenaline Base and actually makes base gear and everything and is still involved with wingsuit flying, but he didn't continue actually like as a manufacturer in terms of like the wingsuits. Uh, what you can see on the suit, although it's a bit unclear, but you can see like here there's little mesh holes that help the wing inflate and there's like here like a cable wire running through that allowed the wing to be released in case of emergency. Um, and two other people that were experimenting were uh, from France, Louis Jean Albert, who then uh, also continued and then actually started his own brand of wingsuits, and uh, Robert Pechnik. Um, 
Roberts, in the end, was like a really good manufacturer, but less well of a marketing man. Uh, and then he met a Finnish entrepreneur, Yari Kusma. And Robert and Yari started working together with Yari, essentially, as the marketing guy. And I think Yari is at the moment the person most credited with sort of bringing the discipline to the people. Because he was the one traveling to all the drop zones and trying to get people to try these death contraptions at that point. Um, and Robert was the one designing, making the suits. Uh, and the same thing essentially happened with uh, Louis Chalbert, who met um, Stefan Zonino and started also with a company called Fly Your Body, which uh, for a long time, or like the French pronounce it, Fly Your Body. Um, they uh, also for a long time produced wingsuits. Um, walking a little bit ahead of the history, the French guys made extremely good wingsuits, but being French, they were like, it's a good product. Why should we advertise the outside of the country? And with skydiving at some point making more the shift towards where the online marketing and everything became much more aggressive and much more important. Sadly, that's one of the brands that sort of fizzled out and stopped, uh, stopped its existence. Um, but the, the wingsuits at this point were doing a glide of around 1.5. So it's about one and a half meters forward for every meter they went down. I'll get back to this number a few more times where you can sort of see where the progression lies in, in like what wingsuits were doing. Um, at this point, what the, what the suits were using, and they're, they're, this picture is a good one to see, is they essentially had a cable system, which is the same yellow cables as like a cutaway. And I can actually do that here. You see here is a loop, and on this side as well. And basically that loop is attached to a cable that runs all the way through. So if there was any issue, and also the way to attach the suit, basically all you had to do was grab these cables, pull them out, and the wings were free. That's also the system that was adapted for like both Fly Your Body and Birdman, the company that uh, Robert and Yari started. The only difference was on one, the cable ran through the arm, and on the other, it ran along the body. But it's all basically the same principle. Looking at rigging of wingsuits, this even to this day is still the most safe and adaptive way of rigging a wingsuit because it uses these little tabs. So it allows you to really adjust where the hole is for the handles. And with every rig being a bit different in how the laterals go down and where the cutaway handles are located, this cable system is the easiest system that there is. The downside is it takes a good five or 10 minutes to rig it. And there, as time progressed, Basically, it shifted to using a zipper system with a fixed hole. And the downside to that zipper system is the hole is always in the same place. Oh, what am I hearing? An echo? Or? Uh, then I, I ignore her. <laughs> but um, no, so the downside about this more modern system with, with basically the fixed zipper holes is that it's not as adaptive in terms of like where the actual holes sit because it's, it's more sort of like a, a, a fixed thing. Um, so what you're there seeing sometimes is that handles can actually go slightly inside the suit, but there sadly consumerism won it because if you get the choice like can I put a wingsuit on in a minute on my rig or, can I, or is it 10 minutes of like, an, you know, like a six year old woman sewing it on, um, people chose and started basically buying the brands that offered the easier rigging. Um, so that is one of the things where sadly actually the, the choices we make in buying actually slightly decreased the safety in terms of like product design. But at the same time, even I'm like, you know, I'm not gonna sew a wingsuit back on. But um, there with like a, a suit that is bought that is like properly fitting, it's of course possible to get a really good fit where it is a safe thing, but it's definitely a good thing. And that is something that I'm gonna mention a few more times during this thing. Um, there's quite a few people that don't jump wingsuits and whenever we're doing pin checks with others, it's sort of like, okay, pin check, pin check, you're wearing a wingsuit, <laughs> pin check. And it's nice to sort of know what to look for. And there's not a whole lot of stuff to look for in a wingsuit, but the main thing is like, is the BOC accessible for the pull? And the main thing is like, are the cutaway handles like always visible? And also if somebody like bends over, which is the thing you tend to do before you get out of an airplane, are the handles not, swallowed up by, you know, the, um, the zipper hole sort of opening. Um, when uh, we hit the year 2000, that was actually the time that YouTube started, or really sort of started to be a popular thing. And that is, I think, the big thing where wing shooting suddenly got catapulted into like the media, uh, the eye of the media. Up till that point, it was sort of like a bit of an invisible discipline, not too many people. There were like commercially available suits, but not too many people were doing that yet. 
Um, it was that same Louis Jalbert that did this flight in Verbier, uh, and he flew over a snowy slope, and there were skiers there. And that is sort of like the first clip that really went viral, where people started noticing, you know, what are wingsuits and what are these like amazing flying squirrel people doing. Um, from there, um, what also happened was it started getting more popular. And at that point, the company Birdman was, I think, the one that realized, like, you know, at this point in time, the way instruction works is like, oh, this is how you put on the suits and let's fly. And so in the year 2000 is when the first actual instructional standard was created in terms of like, how do you teach somebody to fly a wingsuit? How do you set a pattern? Because of course, drop zones at that point were more terrified of seeing somebody in a straight jacket than happy. Um, and yeah, just essentially creating like a safety standard. And that is thankfully something that to this day is still developing and like the, the knowledge and uh, instruction that is available these days you know, to choose from if you want to start wingsuit flying is a lot bigger than many years ago when it was basically just a friend giving you a pat on the back and saying, like, let's try not to screw this one up. Um, the thing that happened in 2001 is basically the first sort of XRW uh, attempt was done. I don't know if everybody knows what XRW is, but it's often referenced as like flying a high performance canopy with a wingsuit together. Over the years, both of the disciplines have evolved like different ways. The canopies have basically more and more turned into like things that fly at speeds that are, you know, besides at landing time, almost not survivable. And the wingsuits have started to fly more and more and slower. And they basically, like still a bit more in the future than where I'm now, they actually met where you can actually fly together. But in the year 2001, it was basically Yari Kusma and Vladi Pesa, a Finn that strapped way too much lead onto, I think like a 79 square foot canopy or something in that range. And they did the first sort of like passing each other roughly at the same speed. Um, they arguably touched, but the, the video evidence is sort of like a zoomed in video from like 10 by 10 pixels. So that is still a thing like they said they did it. Not fully sure if they did it, but um, the real discipline of XRW would not really develop until many years later when wingsuits actually fully matched the performance where people had range to play with each other and canopy pilots were also basically <laughs> flying things that were a lot smaller than what they dared land at that point. Um, in 2004, what happened was that uh, for reasons not publicly uh, known, Yari Kusma and Robert got into sort of like disagreements and Robert basically left the company Birdman and started his own company, Phoenix Fly, which is essentially a continuation of the design work he was doing at the other company. Um, and yeah, from there, continue basically doing the developing and testing. Still to this day, Robert is not too, let's say, excited to meet people and more likes the designing and the flying. And then like now he sends one of his workers, Edo, here to actually present the suits. Robert is a super guy if you get to know him, but definitely like one of the guys where you can really see the inventing of stuff is his main passion and focus. And um, another sort of big step that Wing Shooting took in 2004, the same year that Phoenix Fly started, was that um, they had the very first competition event that was a bit more in an organized way. And it was using, uh, I think the Neptune altimeters that allowed you to sort of see the free fall time. And they started basically doing this competition where in a set altitude window of one kilometer, which is very annoying because the rest of the world uses feet, but between three and two kilometers, the wingsuit basically got measured on how long can you fall. What you could do with that altitude is exit altitude being at 12,000 feet or like, uh, yeah, was it three and a half kilometers, four kilometers, you could dive the wingsuit and then basically try to flare the wingsuit into the competition altitude to get a bit of extra performance. Um, the thing that then, um, what you saw last, people were doing like about 35, 40 seconds of free fall time. If you compare it to today's standards, people are doing over 100 seconds in that window, in that altitude window, which is a combination of skills and knowledge about how to dive in flare or wingsuit having increased. And on top of that, also just the suits, of course, having taken like massive steps up in performance. Um, 2004 also marked, sadly, the last year of the Hercules boogie which was a really big event that I think they ran for uh, every second year for I think four or five years in a row in Sweden. And basically what happened, the army wanted to practice dropping skydivers. So they charged only 20 bucks to take skydivers to 16,000 feet in a Hercules. 
I, up to that point, had only jumped at Cessna two or six drop zones and then <laughs> basically went to the Hercules buggy and like, yeah, jumps out of, uh, out of such a huge plane. Um, sadly, because of war and other things, the planes are now used for other less exciting things, so the buggy never happened again. But the Hercules buggy is sort of the first time that enough wing suitors were actually around. Uh, I, at that point, have been jumping wing suits for about two years, and it really was the thing where if you came to the drop zone, it was like, oh, there's another guy with a wingsuit. And it's, it's, it wasn't that common. And 2004 was the first time where I think they had a good like 30 people on the same drop zone, all with wingsuits. Uh, Craig Poxon, who I don't think wingsuits that much anymore. Um, and actually Andy Ford and Andy Scott were organizing that whole bunch. Um, and that is sort of like where really the formation flying started. And even with some funny things, like if you now look back at the videos, things that didn't make sense, like we were trying to fly like V formations, sort of like in a stacked up way, which exactly kept, like if you're looking at a wingsuit, the turbulence or burble behind it, it's actually angled up. And what we were doing with like the stacked flying was actually staying in the burbles. <laughs> so th like those are things now, if you look back at it, they don't make sense. But it's really like the first time it was like, 15, I think the, the biggest one we did was like 16 or 18 ways there. And um, that is, I think, sort of where that whole thing really took off a bit. Um, 2005 is where, so like the first real sort of XW happened. Um, Chris Martin, he was a jumper, not the singer. Um, he basically took, like similar like to what PD has, I don't know if you've been at the tent, they've got these miniature canopies. And the Chaos, which I, do, I think that was Atar as well. I don't remember which manufacturer that was. But basically, ca they made a Chaos 21, like a demo canopy, just to show like, to people like, in small at, a, at like, the, the PIA and those kind of things. And Chris Martin basically saw that and was like... <laughs> and <laughs> <laughs> so he started jumping that as a cutaway canopy. And then they basically did the first, like, actually, like, four or five ways flying with, like, this 21 square foot canopy, which looked absolutely ridiculous. And, like, the wingsuit is flying with it. Sadly, I think on jump six or seven, Chris Martin actually ended up dying because he had a, just a toggle release, but on a 21 foot square, uh, 21 foot square foot canopy that basically resulted in a spin so fast that he, uh, what they calculated, he was doing something like six or seven spins per second. So he basically passed out almost straight out the door when the canopy started spinning and sadly never recovered and wasn't jumping with an AAD. Something I'll get back to later as well with, with regards to wing suiting. Um, but that was definitely the first time like the canopy wing suit thing happened, but that was still with a canopy that was not in a landable configuration. And it was the same thing with the, the thing I mentioned earlier. They were jumping with a lot of lead and they were jumping with these retractable front risers which like several friends of mine jump with those as well and they sometimes also gave interesting situations where at 4,000 feet the canopy pilot tried to release the, the front riser trim tabs and only one released which again is like not a thing you want um, but um, yeah and another thing that happened that year was that another fin it always seems to be fins when it's like crazy stupid stuff um, he was the very first one to start actually flying with jet engines on his feet and that is something that he actually continued for many years and I think a good five years later he actually achieved level flight with, uh, with the jet engines uh, on his feet. Um, 2006 marked sort of like the first real like big way boogie and that was uh, Kochstedt in Germany um, and there we actually attempted like uh, a first real record. It was going to actually be like two formations, 70 way exit, Guinness there, noting names, uh, and then it would basically exit split off in two groups and you know it would be the biggest exit in the Guinness Book of Records. Was it not for somebody writing his name twice on the form? So it's, uh, I don't recall the guy's name, but let's say, I th I th I, let's call it Mike, but he was called <coughs> Mike Mike the rest of the boogie. Uh, because essentially Guinness has a thing like if you don't declare beforehand exactly what you're doing then um, it doesn't count afterward and I think what happened he was a bit late for the briefing so somebody else put his name on the form and then when he came in last minute he also put his name on the form so it was uh, if you laugh you have to buy beer it was in the end a 69 way um, but yeah it was supposed to be a 70 way so it didn't count as an exit Ellie is paying beer for everyone here <laughs> um, 
big big changes that happened in 2006 was the design of the wing suit itself started evolving a bit more. And like up to that point, you know, I have these slides that I should keep up with what I'm doing. That's uh, Louis Charles there. Uh, and this is what I'm going to come to next. Um, but uh, what started happening with the wingsuits is that the, the wingsuits, depending on the angle you fly at, basically just having a hole with a mesh inlet didn't always catch air. So the biggest design change that happened in 2006 was that the, uh, Robert designed this scooped air inlet. And that scoop air inlet basically got air on the, like, whatever angle you fly. And that is, up to this day, that is a bit the standard in, like, any wingsuit. You'll always see that same, um, that same scoop design. Around this time, so 2006, the glide ratio of wingsuits, and this is a bit of an arbitrary number because at that point GPS and everything was not like fully as common as it is now, but the glide was already at around two. So it's two meters forward for every meter we go down. Um, this was also the point where more companies or more people started getting into uh, wingsuits. Uh, Tony Urigalo, like depending on which country you're in, he's British or US, but <laughs> it's uh, Tony was basically the one getting into wingsuits, and I think Tony at that point gave wingsuits a big kick in the butt, because where Robert and all the other ones were like, ooh, safety, 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 Tony was just like, no, it needs to fly as long as possible, and he made the suits a lot bigger than anybody else really at that point, you know, the, the, what was up till that point in time the biggest wingsuit, by, these stand by the standards today, it's like intermediate or even beginner wingsuits. Like the first wingsuit I jumped, like my own one, like 2003, had like a wing here, and that really was where I got shit from people because it wasn't the absolute complete beginner model, but like the one up, and it's like, are you mad? And it's like, if you see these days what we're flying as like the beginner size, there's definitely a big difference. Um, but um, yeah, so Tony or Tony Suits started doing wingsuit design and Intru there, also a Hungarian company. Um, and like I said, Tony really pushed the sizes up in, in terms of like what wingsuits can do. And of course, every other manufacturer was like, ooh, that works. And started increasing basically the wingsuit design, which also of course came with like the increased, uh, how do you say it, like people getting more comfortable with where what they're flying, the techniques for deployment becoming more refined. So it, it became, at that point, I think it was already around 2004, it became less and less of like an experimental discipline and it became more like a standard skydiving discipline. Um, from there, 2007, uh, Jeb Corliss, uh, we'll get to like a few more <coughs> other times. Don't laugh. Um, Jeb Corliss basically um, also started doing like wingsuit flying and he was already known quite a lot for doing a lot of the base jumping you know, like an object where I would basically just jump and open a parachute he would do like five flips a twist and open and there's some really nice old videos where basically people are doing like acrobatic jumps from like really low altitudes that are really to this day like amazing and sadly the video standards and quality make it sort of hard to watch those older videos but Jeb also got into wingsuits, and Jeb is always a guy that some people tend to, you know, make fun of him, but I think his main talent is he takes a thing he can do, and I think he realizes quite well that for media, you don't always have to do the most dangerous thing. The only thing you have to be able to do is tell media that what you are doing is the most dangerous thing. And basically selling a stunt or something where you're not putting your own life at the line by doing the most risky, stupid stuff, but something moderately safe, I think is, you know, in, in a way also commendable. And he made a really good career out of that. Um, at that point, Jeb was doing uh, a media item for, I think it was GoFast, who was sponsoring a lot of skydiving stuff at that point. I don't even know if the brand is still on the market here, the energy drinks. But, um, and uh, Loic Jean Berre, we talked about earlier, was hired to do uh, camera work on that. So they did a lot of jumps with Luik filming and Jeb and I think somebody else, I don't even remember who that was, but basically flying side by side, doing really cool like three-way formations with uh, the guy under the canopy whose name I sadly forgot to look up. But then one of the jumps, I think it was either Jeb who went low or they basically said to Luik like, ah, you give it a go. And yeah, from what I heard, it was basically just a few seconds after exit, uh, Luik just flew up, took an ankle dock and just flew that stable. And uh, Luik, I think, for like many of the first years is definitely the guy I think who to me was a big inspiration in terms of like the acrobatic flying he was doing and I think also the guy that mostly pushed like the skill side of flying. Um, sadly I think after a speed flying accident he 
uh, stopped wingsuit flying. He's still flying the plane in uh, GUP quite a lot. And if you're actually doing wingsuit jumps, usually you recognize it's Louis because the porter is actually doing loops behind the wingsuit formation. But uh, he's definitely one of the guys that's worth looking up. And especially to the people that are younger in skydiving, a film I can really recommend to try and look up is Crosswind. It's like this older video that shows a lot of the different skydive disciplines um, with um, yeah, basically really like expert cinematography really shot on film. And there's just sequences in that video where Loic is doing like barrels over people and like acrobatics that even to this day are for most people like above the standard of what's, what people can do. Um, from, um, from the flying basically that we're, uh, that we're talking about there, um, the, sorry, the XOW doc stuff that I talked about. What also happened in 2007 is that the performance flying format that I talked about earlier, which was mainly just about trying to fly a suit as long as possible, at that point the GPS, like the garments, came onto the market, and that really gave the, the performance flying a big boost in that they created actually like three disciplines, all within that same one kilometer exit or so one kilometer competition altitude, somewhere in the middle of the jump. And there would basically be three rounds. The first round, you measure what, how much free fall time you do. Second round, you measure how far you can fly. And the third round, you measure how fast you can fly. In the, so, which is basically trying to find like an angle where, of course, the steeper you go, the faster you go. But there's definitely an angle where once you go steep, you're going more down and forward. So it's trying to find a sort of balance angle of like, where do I go fastest? Um, and it's especially the addition of this distance element that really started pushing the performance flying and started having people experiment more with diving, flaring, and trying to really milk the performance where you're trying to maximize the distance that you're flying. Um, and that is actually what at that point started really pushing the glide ratio up as well because, and the thing that is sometimes confusing is like that the scores you're seeing in those competitions are not the actual glide ratios that a wingsuit are doing. It's if you're basically looking at like, okay, if you put a wingsuit in the sky, you just let it fly, and it does say a glide ratio of around 2.8, that same wingsuit in that competition altitude with a dive and basically, that was good timing. <laughs> Which is again, my best friend, Ellie. That was Ollie, that was Ollie. Oh. That was definitely Ollie. Yeah, okay. <laughs> So, um, but that really, like the, the factors of having that dive and that flare, and on top of that, a tailwind, and like doing a very rough thing, like say you're flying at about 100, k in a, uh, 100 kilometers per hour, or let's make it, because it's easier math, and I at the moment suck at doing that, it's like top of my mind. If you're looking at flying 60 kilometers per hour forward, that means that you're basically doing one kilometer per minute in terms of like forward speed. So what happens if you're jumping with a 60 kilometer per hour tailwind, you get a 0.1 added to your distance or to your glide ratio just from the fact that you have a tailwind. And that is why getting the true performance of a wingsuit is quite a hard thing unless you really start working with like pitot tubes and like the way that planes accurately measure it. So the results we're seeing on like wingsuit competitions are always related to the factors like there's basically a lot of kinetic energy that they take in from a dive. And on top of that, they're taking in a lot of tailwind. And sometimes that actually also works the other way around. Like one of the big competitions in Germany always gets quite limited in terms of the airspace they can use. So they tend to drop people into wind instead of like with the wind in the back, which you immediately see takes the results down from like a glide ridge of four to like 2.6 or 2.4. So it's <coughs> their wind and like the, the amount of energy you put into like a dive is a big consequence. That is with the modern wingsuits to the degree where if you take a wingsuit into a dive, which in a wingsuit I think maxes out around say 300, maybe 350, but taking like a maximum speed dive and then flaring a wingsuit, it does allow wingsuits to briefly even do climbs. So, um, and that is definitely a big like step up from what we were able to do like in the older days with the smaller suits there. Um, what happened in 2008, so we're going another, um, or we're, st we're skipping one sort of funny thing. There was also this uh, German guy who basically did a similar thing as like Visa with the jets, uh, but he took like the water, uh, what is it, hydrogen peroxide, and put way too much in a bottle on his belly, <laughs> and then with a hose to his feet, and that's essentially a bit similar to like the, the guys that do like the, the short flights, and that basically only gave him like a 15 second boost where he like is kicked in the back, 
shut up, but it is definitely like one of the sort of like weird pioneering things as well. And if you look up like wingsuits, I think wingsuit rocket flight or something like that, because that is the only sort of like real thing that there's quite interesting video on that stuff as well. Um, uh, another big step uh, that happened in 2008 was that wing shooting basically went into um, having like the first acrobatic competition. Um, the competition was organized in Spa, Belgium, and basically involved like the current format of like two-way formation and a camera guy and a set of pre-described routines, which at that point I think was like three figures, but uh, all flying together and basically doing something quite similar to the current format. The judging has changed a lot over the years, but the format was basically the same already at that point. Um, another sort of first thing that happened after the comp with people actually involved in the competition was the first sort of like unofficial docked record was set. Um, and that was basically a five-way docked formation. Um, the funny thing is, till this day, I don't think that that has been sort of like broken. It's just really hard with the wingsuits, where normally you have a bit of motion in the hands, but in a wingsuit, if somebody starts hanging on a hand, you start dropping out of the sky. So in the sky, there hasn't really been anything bigger than five or maybe six ways, but it's that's still sort of like one of the true things that made wingsuits, um, wingsuit records quite hard. Um, Another thing that happens with um, uh, that helped a lot with with wingsuiting, especially to the type of audience that wingsuiting sort of caters to, is that the the performance competition went online, so people could literally fight over who was the best wingsuiter on the internet, um, and you could upload your score and sort of see what you were doing. That definitely gave wingsuiting a big boost in a positive way because. Uh, talking a bit negative about wingsuiting, especially in the in the first five or ten years, there was basically two kinds of wingsuiters. There was the people that sort of uh, wanted to do more, like the slight idiots that like doing like the scary stuff. But there was also the people, and that that was a lot of the wingsuiters that basically were either not fitting in or bored. And there's not like a lot of really good solo disciplines in skydiving and wingsuiting in the beginning. Like having a wingsuit and your GPS, it's like every nerd's dream you know you can jump you land and the computer says no or yes and if your jump was good so and there the online competition stuff definitely gave wingsuiting a big boost because people could really start comparing scores and start fighting online about you know who flew better and then if somebody had a higher score they could argue on a forum about that it was wind and not actual performance so it's there definitely that is sort of like where wingsuiting definitely took a bit of a nerdy turn that I think even to this day you definitely see like if you talk to wingsuiters quite quickly it is talking about glide ratios and all the all those things. Um, I'm deliberately not talking about base jumping too much because that's is actually been like a main drive in like both testing, flying, and doing a lot of wingsuiting. But this being a skydiving event and having limited time, that is almost like a complete separate history. Um, but um, from uh, that year, there was also like the, the World Base Race was organized, um, which was the same competition format that basically took it into base. Uh, at that point, Birdman also for some reason started making underwears, belts, and jeans, and stopped making wingsuits. Um, from there, like there's, there's, that's where like the really big steps happened. And uh, 2009 is basically where the first. Uh, unofficial no uh, unintentional no canopy landing happened um, and it was uh, basically a guy named Reiner who was filming somebody on a base jump and he started looking up more and more and more stalled the suit hit a few trees and survived uh, a few years later I think 2018 there was another guy who did the same thing in Chamonix and also survived but it would take a Brit to later do it like intentionally and good um, and in Skydive Elsinore, they did the first like official like record formation that uh, I think Guinness ratified, but I'm not sure. But it was a 68-way formation, like actually people flying in like a grid pattern, which was always still a bit of a debate on like how do we actually judge the distance with like deformation of the lens and stuff. But that is again more like the nerdy side online. But the good thing with the, all the formation records is that it really started pushing people to you know learn to fly a wingsuit and especially the records being quite accessible. I know Jenna's telling me to speed up. <laughs> but, um, from there, like a lot of stuff that happened is uh, in the US, the first wingsuit rental company started showing up. Uh, in, of course, Dubai started showing up at that point. They did the first real big like XOW formations. 
uh, they started doing like real like first big XRW formations, which also started making that more and more a mainstream discipline. Also, because swooping at that point had progressed to the point where people are flying like smaller and better canopies to to do this together with wingsuits. Um, Another thing that's uh, happened is Michael Cooper, a Canadian guy, actually started coming up with essentially like a volume meter, it's like a GPS that actually gave audio feedback based on like what you're doing in, uh, in flying that allowed people to sort of focus on the jump, keep watching, but in the air actually hear what your glide ratio is doing. Um, the glide ratio at that point, if you're looking at scores, is around 2.6. If you're looking at uh, like continuing to like 2000, 12 to 2014 that goes up to around three and if you look in the last few years the competition scores are still going up as people are getting better and suits are getting better at like the diving flaring and essentially milking that but looking at the glide ratio from around the year 1999 till about say 2014-15 the glide ratio is sort of leveled out and I think and that is mostly also what I got from Robert Kretschnik that is mostly related to the fact that we're just approaching the limit of what you can do. If you compare it to like canopies, a canopy from 20 years ago is still doing the exact same glide ratio as a canopy now. The only thing that has improved massively is the handling. How canopies swoop, dive, flare, stay, stay pressurized. Looking at wingsuits, it's a bit hard to see these days with every advertising you see from any manufacturer. The suit starts earlier, flies even further. In reality, these differences are so minimal and like especially like in sustained glide ratio we're definitely seeing that it's it's leveling out and there there's not too many steps you can take besides maybe really going towards a thing where the word suit starts to leave and you start adding like rigid wings or other things if you're looking at like wingsuit i would guess it's around three sustained glide if you look at uh, Rossi or like the dubai guys with the wings Without the engines, those wings, from what I got, are already doing like a 4.5 or something like a 5.0 glide ratio. So, like almost double of what we're doing with the wingsuit, just with a rigid wing, because that just has much better aerodynamics. So, wingsuit-wise, design-wise, there's a good chance that we're actually sort of limited to where we are. Um, another thing that happened there uh, with wingsuit flying was uh, Jeb Corliss flew through like that hole in China, which again was like a big boost in media. Um, wingsuiting started showing up in movies, not always as realistic, <laughs> <laughs> but wingsuits anyways. Um, and also, um, the first official like national championship started showing up in several countries. First performance, later also acrobatics, and that really helped because wingsuiting up till that point was sort of like this thing you put on a suit, you wave at each other, and it's sort of like big white tracking jumps, but there wasn't too much of a goal. And with the official competitions in performance and acrobatics, it really started giving people a goal where you could train towards in terms of uh, what you were doing. Um, another thing that happened in 2012, which is more just a funny sideline, uh, Jeb Corliss started to advertise these goggles that instead of audio, you can see what your glide ratio is. One of the first jumps he used them on, I think, was Table Mountain, which he hit at the same time. Um, I think he blamed the balloon as well, but it uh, definitely was also a big televised like wingsuit thing. And there you'll see a lot that's like, especially the, the media attention, even though some of it is negative, it always did lead to like wingsuiting becoming more and more like a big thing that's basically okay. made it to where today, I think if we're talking to like AFF students, uh, I think most of the AFF students start to mention like wingsuiting and especially like proximity flying as like a thing why they're getting into skydiving. And it's, um, I think it's definitely given it like a boost. Not sure if it's always a positive boost, but a boost nonetheless. Um, the big thing that's, uh, that also happened at this point, like the suits got so big and there we can roughly categorize suits in about four categories. You got like the small or rookie suits. And this is more a thing like if you're doing that gear check and you want to see, it, the main thing to see is like does the suit match somebody's experience level and they're quite quickly these days because everybody flies really big suits people tend to upgrade a very rough indication like 0 to 25 jumps or so people should definitely be flying like in a small beginner suit which essentially is a suit that ends like at or just like slightly above the hips basically just meaning you can access a BOC without any issue then you have the intermediate suits which tends to be a bit bigger and there the wings tend to go to the knee or slightly below the knee which already makes the the pull like slightly harder but the main thing is like when you make rough movements the bigger wing surface also makes you move around more aggressively 
then there's sort of like what we, up to like I think 2012 was like the big suits. Um, and they have like a gripper that sort of extends the wing and the wing tends to extend a bit past the tail as well, which is like a big size. And they're definitely having a good like 100 to 200 jumps is a very good like level to have. Mainly just because not what happens when it goes right, but like when in a tumble, it's a lot of fa uh, fabric that's basically that you have to work with to actually, you know, get to your handles and do what you got to do. There's on top of that, so like the really big suits or jokingly called the carpets sometimes as well. They tend to have like not just this wing, but also uh, like this gripper, but instead of the wing cutting in, the wing almost being like straight. And when you look at somebody in a suit like that, it's basically like seeing just like a square. But those other suits that in performance are doing definitely like speeds that are so low that they've got massive range on canopies and like on separation, they actually fly up and away from a canopy in terms of what they're doing. Um, Another big thing with uh, with wingsuits, and that's also related to the, um, um, it's like like I said, like if you see a wingsuit, the big thing to check, if you see somebody in a huge suit, if that person has like 20 or 30 wingsuit jumps, that is probably the least smart idea. And the sad thing is, it's not just something involving the person's safety, but also if that person ends up, you know, being too busy with flying because of low experience and end up flying like past canopies or getting close to the tail of an airplane, those are definitely factors that um, that should not be uh, letting wings should be something that you just ignore in a corner and like talking to people or learning a bit more about it so that you can make an informed decision if this person should be in the airplane or at minimum if it's wise to get out before him um, is definitely a thing that would help a lot with safety in the drop zone. Um, other small things to watch is just, you know, if people have an altimeter they can see, definitely the hand altimeters tend to be a bit hard to see, especially with the bigger suits. So there you'll mostly see wingsuiters usually refer to these like chest alties that JC does a really nice one of. <laughs> Pay you later. Um, and, um, and on top of that, um, AAD. And the AAD is like a big factor. There are definitely wingsuits have progressed to the point where they are at this point doing speeds that go lower like even when you're not doing anything than what some AADs can detect and there have been instances already sadly where the AADs didn't fire. That is why Cypress at the moment is the first one doing actually an AAD that uses basically a lower activation speed to basically give you like that added safety margin and then the only thing that the AAD does is once you're under an open parachute it switches back to the normal mode so that you basically don't fire it when you accidentally just do a small turn. So, and that is like one of the good things where like all the gear we use for safety as skydiving is progressing, it starts to go outside of like the design, so like the original design limits. And that is why it's good that there's still like design like the AD or like special like altimeters that help with glide and other things to, uh, to make it safer. And now I need to round up the last part in five minutes. <laughs> but um, so yeah, other big things that happens, uh, Gary Connery uh, landed in boxes. I still remember that I was at that time saying like, that is not survivable, but Gary clearly knew more about boxes and speeds than I did. So uh, this is, yeah, the big way jump. Um, another person that was really active in wingsuiting for a while until he sadly died, which is especially in base, a very common theme where people tend to always be looking for the next thing. And at some point, sadly, you know, the, the ground is a very harsh limit. But uh, Alexander Poli was also a guy that was very active in the media and, um, yeah, but it also did one of these flights through like a much smaller cave that also really went viral. Um, big media thing that um, happened then, which is around 2014, is Fred and Vince actually jumped the Burj Khalifa, both in tracking suits doing like the amazing free fly stuff they do, and in wing suits, I think actually flying one or two complete laps around the building. Um, and um, Birdman at that point started sort of producing suits again, but since they stopped initially, they never really took off again. And I think to this day, that company still has a website, but it's aside from like older suits on the markets and especially beginner suits, there's not really a lot of those you see around anymore. Um, another event that happened that year for the first time was Red Bull Aces, which was essentially like a helicopter race um, with four helicopters with big banners around it and like slaloming around it, which, <laughs> is I think one of the many things where they tried making wingsuiting in into like a spectator sport, which is just a very hard thing. Cause like even Aces, like I, I remember like the times I was doing it, jumping out of a helicopter and then basically doing a head down dive at another helicopter 
which has this thing on top that's... <laughs> you get very sweaty if you get close. Uh, you know, and also like races where people are essentially doing the same thing Formula One cars are doing, like around turns, and like you cannot see or care if somebody else is coming in when the body is essentially the, you know, the, um, the thing that gets a crash. I think the hardest thing with wingsuit flying is turning it into a spectator sport. And there's been many attempts, but it's always been a hard thing. Showing how like in its infancy wingsuiting still was, it took until, and I have to see here, but I think it was 2015, yeah, to, to actually do the first backfly formation like with nine people. And that is now thankfully to this day, like that's been growing a lot more where we're doing it with a lot more people. And the, uh, now it's like a standard skill. But up to that point, it was like really special if you could backfly. And like these days, it's something that if people cannot backfly within 20 jumps, it's like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> so, um, and uh, another thing that happened that year, which did a big thing for wing shooting, is that uh, FAI actually accepted wing shooting as an official discipline, which of course, like, also came with its problems with rules being simplified and everybody not being happy. But all in all, it's done a lot of positive growth and now having like actually official world championships in wing shooting and uh, world cups, it's definitely motivating a lot of people to train and to get better in that, uh, that side of flying. Um, meaning I'm actually gonna get through this thing in time against other people's bets. Um, the, um, the thing that happened in 2016 was that uh, there was a, uh, essentially an old building in Sweden with one of those horizontal wind tunnels they used to test cars and airplanes. And it was uh, offered up for sale. As it was close to an airport where the buildings cannot be a certain height, they offered it to a lot of people. And by accident, it was offered to a few people that had like skydiver friends and two of them were skydivers and engineers. And they basically said like, you know what? We think we can convert this to a wingsuit tunnel. So inside the tunnel, they basically put a very small angled section at the end with the wind instead of circulating as just blowing straight into the wall. As you can see behind here, like you can actually see the horizontal part continuing. You can see the top part of like the original circle here. But, and that is the point where I also got invited to come by. And then within about 10, 20 minutes, we were doing like back flying uh, rolls and uh, a few weeks later also like some two-way stuff. Um, and that really launched, I think, a really nice sort of new direction for wingsuiting where the focus is purely on the skills. And the big thing you see a lot with wingsuiting is people quite quickly resort to like gear. It's like, oh, I'm not catching the formation. I should get a bigger suit. I'm not falling snow a lot. And people are sort of like in a reverse way of swooping where people go smaller and smaller to swoop better. With wingsuit, you see quite quick that people take the opposite route and they go to bigger and bigger wingsuits while Quite often, they can't even fly the, the smaller suit to like 60% of its ability. And there, the wingsuit tunnel has definitely been like a really good thing to really push the skills. And it's been amazing fun being involved uh, together with Jenna in basically creating all the coaching in the tunnel, especially when it comes to like all the two-way acrobatic stuff. Um, and we've over the, over the last two years or two and a half years, we've really like pushed it up to a higher level where like the flying we're doing now is like 10 times better than the flying we ourselves were doing like before the tunnel because just like in the exact same way as vertical tunnels it has allowed for basically training like a year's worth in like a day or day and a half and i think another big thing that it has potential for and it's not there yet but it's the first time wing shooting can actually be a spectator sport without turning it into like proximity flying where you risk seeing somebody actually impact um, and another big, really big thing has been that it's opened up the flying to basically any person off the street. Like I, w uh, we've had kids of seven years old, people without any skydives. There's quite a few people in the tunnel without skydive experience that are flying better than several wingsuiters I know. <laughs> Ellie, <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> they're quite good. I've seen them online. <laughs> no, but. Um, no, but there, it's definitely pushed like the standards. And like the biggest thing that is more on a personal level, it's really allowed us to, instead of flying next to somebody and frustratingly pointing in an arm where somebody else keeps turning away from me <coughs> in the sky, I can now just grab an arm and put it in the right position, which is of course quite what everybody knows from the vertical tunnel. Um, and especially with the acrobatic stuff that we've been doing, it's really pushed the level up. <laughs> Thank you.
thing I try to sort of highlight the history because the, the big thing is like everybody like the wing shooters tend to be more like the younger crowd so uh, or and younger I mean like people that have been skydiving only for a few years there's there's a big influx of new people so not a lot of people know the actual like long history and there's not really like a proper like documented history so I try to highlight like I think what were a few of the important things should anybody this is the shameless plug part should anybody ever be interested in trying of course you can Join us in a wingsuit tunnel. Jen and I are there every month for a week doing camps. So you're uh, all welcome to come and try it, no matter what experience, what age. And um, should anybody have any questions, if it's like questions for everyone, I would say we can take two or three minutes to do that now. If anybody has like a more personal question about anything else, then find us in the bar tonight and we can also talk further. Any questions? Then uh, everyone in favor of beer, say aye. Aye. <laughs> Let's do this. Okay.